This video was brought to you by Nebula. Hello friends, my name is JJ, and in the many years that I have been doing cultural analysis videos, something I have grown increasingly self-conscious about is the fact that I have never introduced any unique jargon. Jargon is very important in the world of cultural commentary because it helps make your ideas easily identifiable as they enter the broader discourse and thereby help build up your public profile. So for example, every time you read about greenwashing, Generation X, or manic pixie dream girls, you inevitably wind up hearing about Jay Westerveld, Douglas Copeland, and Nathan Rabin, since they were the guys who came up with those terms. In this glorious internet age of ours, where people are more obsessed than ever with classifying and sorting cultural phenomena, the race to get your jargon taken seriously has become hyper-competitive and sometimes even a little bossy. There's this duo in Washington State who are really determined to make the term metamodern a thing, for instance. They have a whole website devoted to explaining and hyping the concept, complete with a logo, monthly newsletter, and multiple social media accounts. And then of course you have all of the various wikis and things in which some small cabal of Reddit types will try to will into existence a concept like anarcho-geosyndicalism or zygosexuality. But, as Mayor Quimby once said, if that is the way the winds are blowing, let no one say I do not also blow. So today, I want to introduce you to my first official cultural analysis jargon term, which is the concept of 4D characters. So this is an idea that I first came up with a while ago when I made that video talking about Jean Baudrillard and his famous book, Simulacra and Simulation, which is all about the artificiality of modern life. Baudrillard was a postmodern French philosopher, and like many members of that set, his ideas were never super clearly articulated, but they were inspiring and influential in their vibe, and they have motivated generations of creators and commentators in various ways. In recent years, his legacy has received renewed attention in the form of these simulacra memes, where a thing is depicted as becoming a more and more abstracted deviation from its original true form. A classic example would be this one, which shows a pumpkin devolving from a real-world plant to an artificial flavor in synthetic coffee creamer. This whole structure is based on a passage from the book where he talks about the four phases of a simulation. Now, I like these memes a lot, but I also think that a lot of them are trying to explore a concept that is somewhat distinct from what Monsieur Baudrillard himself was interested in. Baudrillard was very critical of the modern world and wanted to expose the phoniness of it, particularly the degree that our senses and feelings are manipulated by made-up nonsense pushed by the media. These memes, by contrast, seem motivated by a much more irreverent desire to simply document the often amusing degree that we humans are capable of grasping increasingly strange abstractions of cultural phenomena. They often come off as more playful and curious than anything. In other words, the fact that a product as weird as Swedish fish Oreos can exist could be taken as evidence justifying a sort of Baudrillardian pessimism about the sort of artificial nonsense that modern capitalism imposes upon us. But a more upbeat take would just interpret Swedish fish Oreos as a culturally complicated product that presumes the consumer understands and appreciates cookies, Oreos, and Swedish fish, which are three rather discreet cultural ideas. And this is where the patented JJ theory of 4D characters comes in. A 4D character is just my name for a thing that has four degrees of cultural complexity, in the sense that you have to understand three other cultural concepts before you can understand the thing itself. Unlike the Baudrillardian four-phase symbolic evolution system, which seeks to document the process of abstractification, JJ's revolutionary 4D character system is more interested in documenting how many distinct cultural traditions can be embodied by a single character. I am using the term character because I think it is easiest to think of this concept in terms of fictional characters, but as we will see, it works for other things too. 
So the other day, the Nintendo people released a trailer for their new Mario game, Super Mario Wonder. And during the course of that preview, they introduced the world to a new bad guy character called Mumsy. Mumsies can be unraveled if you position yourself just right. Now, I found this character really fascinating just because of how culturally complex he is despite being such a seemingly minor character in the new game. Mummies are of course actual things from ancient Egypt, ritualistically prepared corpses that have long been a subject of great fascination in the West, particularly following the excavation of the mummy of King Tutankhamun in 1922. <gasps> In 1940, Universal Pictures released a movie called The Mummy's Hand, about an Egyptian mummy that comes back to life and causes trouble. And the movie was so popular that in subsequent decades, a reanimated mummy became a sort of generic type of monster in American folklore, and eventually Japanese folklore as well. There are accordingly a lot of generic mummy type bad guys in Japanese video games, and now there is one in the Mario franchise as well. This makes the Mumsy a perfect example of a 4D character. He embodies four discrete cultural traditions. Real world mummies, the original universal mummy movie character, the generic Halloween type mummy, and then Mumsy himself. Mumsy could not exist in a world in which these three other cultural traditions did not also exist. Now, let us contrast a character like Mumsy to the beloved McDonald's mascot, Grimace. Grimace, I would say, is a 1D character because he has no cultural complexity at all. He is just a made-up fantasy creature designed to be the McDonald's mascot. His friend, the Officer Big Mac, is slightly more complex. In addition to McDonald's itself, he refers to a specific McDonald's burger, the Big Mac, as well as a certain conception of an early 20th century American police officer with the long coat and British style helmet and star badge. But even that only gets him to 3D. A truly 4D McDonald's character would be Grimace's seldom seen Uncle O Grimacy. He is a reference to a specific McDonald's product, the Shamrock Shake that they sell around St. Patrick's Day, as well as a certain stereotypical conception of an Irish person and the character of the original Grimace. Once again, three layers of prior cultural knowledge are required to understand the fourth. Or how about the beloved meme character Apu Staya, also known as Peepo. He is a gentler spin-off of the earlier crueler Pepe meme character, who was in turn an unauthorized rip-off of the original Pepe character created by the cartoonist Matthew Fury. And of course, Pepe is supposed to be a frog, which although maybe not the most exciting thing in the world, still counts as a layer of his cultural complexity. But a 4D character doesn't have to be a literal cartoon character. Another good example would be the goofy boots that old What's-His-Face wore to the streamies the other day. These boots were released by the art collective Mischief, and they are an adaption of their previous set of novelty boots. These things the so-called big red boots. These are supposed to be based on the sort of boots worn by the beloved 80s era anime character Astro Boy. The boots that Eric wore, however, were created as part of a collaboration with Crocs, makers of those lightweight sandal type things that have risen to become one of the most polarizing pieces of footwear of the last 20 years. So, for those keeping track, that is four layers of cultural meaning going on here. Astro Boy, Mischief's Big Red Boots, Crocs, and then the final culmination of the Crocs Mischief collab itself. If you could travel back in time and show these things to someone a hundred years ago, they wouldn't be able to understand them as anything other than really weird looking shoes because the people back then would lack any understanding of their deeper cultural significance. When Eric wears them to the streamies in the year 2023, however, much of the audience is able to understand them as something very specific and particular because in 2023, we have knowledge of Astro Boy and Mischief and Crocs. The boots can even be understood as offering a sort of multi-layered commentary on modern American society 
based on the specific meanings that we associate with their component cultural influences. And speaking of social commentary, how about this creation made by the Argentine art duo known as Pool and Marianella. So it is obviously a satire of Barbie, the most popular doll of the 20th century. And it is also a reference to the Virgin of Guadalupe, which is a very popular symbol of Mexican Catholicism said to be based on an apparition that appears to an indigenous Mexican in the 16th century. And it was a vision of the Virgin Mary, who is of course the mother of Jesus Christ. Now, as a work of satirical art, you could easily appreciate this piece just knowing it was a doll of the Virgin Mary. But knowing precisely what kind of doll Barbie is and what she represents in American culture, and what the Guadalupe version of Mary likewise represents in Mexican culture communicates a much deeper, sharper message. Now, whether they are literal characters or just things, and whether the media that they appear in is deep or shallow, I would say that 4D characters are overall still relatively uncommon. I think it's much more common to encounter cultural things that are either completely unique ideas or only noticeably influenced by like one other cultural concept. But even if 4D characters are small in overall quantity, the number of things in the culture that rely on simultaneous familiarity with multiple distinct cultural concepts to properly appreciate has also never been larger. And this is because we are living in an era of cultural complexity that is truly unparalleled in all of human history. The last 100 years or so have seen the advent of movies, television, video games, and the internet, in addition to the continuing growth of literature, music, food, fashion, sports, and fine art. More and more cultural products are being produced with every passing year, and as they cross-pollinate and cross-reference each other, our collective standards of cultural literacy invariably become higher and higher. A while back, I made a video about the popular theory that cultural works can generally be described as either pre-modern, modern, or post-modern, depending on in what era they were made and what their relationship is to the traditions of the era that came before or after. And as identifiably postmodern things have begun to fade, there has been growing interest among some cultural analysts in trying to come up with a theory of a fourth phase of cultural evolution to describe the traditions of the era that we're in now. Those guys I mentioned earlier who are trying to push the idea of meta-modernism are one example. I personally do not think that there is going to be a clear fourth era equivalent to the previous three, but I do think that the nature of cultural products for the foreseeable future will be characterized by increasing amounts of references and callbacks to the increasingly vast amounts of cultural products that came before, including cultural products that themselves contain references and callbacks to other cultural products that came before them. This is why, in turn, that I believe cultural education is so important, why young people, in particular, should receive a primarily fact-based education that teaches them to be able to identify and understand the broadest range of people, places, and things that culturally literate adults will refer to in their speech, writing, and art. Even if it's something as simple as a Mario enemy. So, obviously, you guys know where I'm going with this. I came up with the idea of a 4D character, and now I'm hoping that you guys can help me think of some more examples. Like all revolutionary new theories, this one is obviously still in quite an early stage of development, so if any of you have some ideas on how I could refine or improve it, I would be happy to hear that as well. And I would love to do a follow-up video if interest seems high. Apologies for the shorter video than usual this week. Last week's was pretty exhausting. But if you are hungry for more high quality videos than I myself alone can provide, then I know just the place to go. This week's video sponsor, Nebula. Hello friends, so yes it is true, I am once again coming to you to sing the praises of Nebula, the very best place on the internet to watch high quality educational videos from all of your favorite YouTuber buddies, including me. Not only does Nebula host ad-free versions of our videos, it also hosts a ton of original content that you can't find anywhere else. This includes extended versions of YouTube videos featuring bonus scenes, such as an extended version of this video where I discuss an additional three 
40 characters. But then there are also the Nebula Originals, which are exclusive full-length videos made explicitly for Nebula. This not only includes non-fiction specials like Wendover's The Logistics of X series, but also scripted works like Patrick Willem's 90-minute sci-fi extravaganza, Night of the Coconut. Now, ordinarily, Nebula only costs $2.50 a month, or 30 bucks a year, which I think we can all agree is a pretty good deal, all things considered. But during this month, they are having a particularly wild deal where you can get a lifetime membership for 300 bucks. That's right, Nebula membership for life. Even if you're like that guy I saw in Piers Morgan the other day who plans to live to be 600. In addition to saving you money over the course of the next few centuries, the $300 membership tier is also an excellent way that you can support your favorite Nebula creators. Nebula reinvests a lot of their revenues into commissioning original works from their creators, like like the stuff I mentioned earlier. So by opting into the $300 club, you are making a substantial investment in the platform and giving opportunities to creators like me to pursue new creative projects on it. So yes, whether you are looking for a monthly subscription or a forever one, just give a click on the link in the thing below and join the Nebula scene today. Wow, Nebula sure sounds great, eh? Thank you so much for the sponsorship and thank you for watching. Do not forget to like and subscribe and I will see you all next week.